G'day, brothers and sisters, friends, good to see you. Welcome to church. Let me greet you in the words of uh, 1 Peter. He writes, to God's elect, exiles, scattered throughout, we could say, the provinces of Sydney and beyond, perhaps, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Welcome to church. My name's Andy. I'm one of the ministers here, and it is really wonderful to be able to gather together, even like this, to meet with God and to meet together as his people. Uh, I suspect, like me, you've uh, heard many national anthems this week uh, with the, uh, the Olympics going on. And of course, national anthems, they're an interesting thing, aren't they? But they're songs that declare who we are, uh, what we stand for. So for instance, Australia, we declare that we are one and free. Uh, the Americans, they like to declare that they are the uh, land of the free, the home of the brave, and uh, the Germans. I wonder if you know your German, Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber, alles, Germany, over all, right? These uh, national anthems declare what we believe, uh, who we are. Well, I, we sometimes uh, say creeds in church together, and these creeds are a little bit like uh, our national anthem, if you like, because by saying these words together, we are declaring who we are, uh, what we believe, what we stand for. And the great thing about uh, saying these creeds, especially uh, like this, perhaps you're the only one in your house at the moment, but as we affirm these things together, we're actually uh, remembering that we are connected to Christians across Sydney, across the world, and even across history. For Christians uh, are bound to the one Lord Jesus by faith, and we are united together by the one Holy Spirit. So I invite you, maybe you could stand where you are, but certainly join in, let's declare in what's a bit like our national anthem, the Apostles' Creed. Brothers and sisters, let's say this together. What do we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And kids, I wonder if there are some phrases or uh, words there that you don't know, why not pause the video now and ask mum and dad. Mum and dad, if you're not quite sure, why not uh, find out? Because uh, this is indeed the things that we believe um, so I encourage you to, to, to ponder them. Um, but as we begin our time together, we're going to sing together, declaring our praises of the God who loves us, of our Saviour who is with us, who never changes. So uh, let's stand and let's sing together.
where you are joining us uh, in a teaching series as we journey through 1 Samuel together. Um, But as we dive in again today, where are we up to so far? It's always worth remembering, isn't it? Navigating, uh, you need to know where you are. Uh, Where are we in the, the story of 1 Samuel? Well, we are in the time of Judges, a time when Israel are God's saved people. They are now in the promised land, uh, but it's a morally and spiritually disastrous time. Israel have descended to complete moral decay, actually. Uh, Judges finishes with those kind of scary words in a way. In those days, there was no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Anarchy. However, right in the book of Samuel, we're introduced to one godly woman named Hannah. Uh, In chapter 1, we saw that she couldn't have kids, but after pouring out her heart to God, God answers her prayer, grants her her a child uh, named Samuel, baby Samuel. Well, that's big news, right? Whenever in the Bible story a barren woman has a child, we should sit up and take notice. God's about to do something big for his people. Uh, And Hannah's song of praise last week gave us a little hint, didn't it? A king is on the horizon. But today, as we come to the second half of chapter 2, there's still rot in Israel's leadership, and Samuel's only a boy. What happens next? Well, let's find out today as we come to God's word in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel. But before we do, here's a little video uh, to help us Uh, see that this is real stuff that we're talking about. This is a real story. Uh, This video takes us to the place where the action happens. So watch this. Did Shiloh exist? Was it a real place? Does it match the location of the biblical text? Does the function of the city serve the same function that it did in biblical text? Was it a holy site where sacrifices offered there? Those are all questions that I think can be helped by the study of archeology. span Back in the 1980s, Israel Finkelstein led an Israeli dig here and you can see the work that they did exposing the big fortification wall that surrounds the entire perimeter. What we have done is take his work and on the other side of us the work that the Danish did in the 1920s and 1930s and we're connecting the two. Now the tabernacle supposedly was here for several hundred years. Do you have any places here at the site where you think it stood? It's all about the Mishkan which is the presence of God and I think it answers that most basic of all human questions like how do I connect with God? The tabernacle gives us a way to do that and this is why it's so critically important and in the center of it is the Ark of the Covenant. These are the main ideas. Was the tabernacle on the northern platform outside the city wall? Was it on the summit, the apex of the tell? Number three, it could have been on the southern approach. There's four churches on the southern approach. Mm -hmm. Well, the Christians seem to really like the idea of the tabernacle being there because they're building their churches there on that spot. It may have also been functional. It's very flat and it could have fit over there. Now, I've introduced a fourth possibility, and that's that the tabernacle may have been mobile at Shiloh. Mm -hmm. It was not in one spot. By its very nature, it's mobile. They are slaughtering a large volume of animals. Certain times of the year, if you've got the tabernacle set up, say, down here, and the wind is blowing this direction, (laughs) it's just going to be unbearable and not hygienic. Maybe seasonally, the tabernacle is moving around Shiloh, so it's not that one side is sacred, maybe the whole side is sacred. And are you finding evidence for Israelite presence on this site during the Iron Age when Samuel was supposed to have been here? Oh, absolutely. We've got abundant evidence of that. You see a transition here from the Amorites who dwelled, sometimes we say Canaanites, but in the hill country, they're Amorites actually that were living here. In some ways, you can see that a different ethnic group or a different theological persuasion has come in. Do we see a shift in the material culture? Do we have Hebrew inscriptions and writing? Yes, we do. So there's no doubt that in the period of the tabernacle, that there were Israelites at Shiloh. Now's the time to grab your Bibles, uh, your talk outlines, and the activity sheets that are available from our kids' church. 
uh, so that the kids can stay uh, engaged in our time of teaching. So if you need to, press pause now. Uh, go grab those things, grab your Bible and come back, press play, uh, because now we're going to hear God's word read to us and then Mark's going to come and teach us. Our first Bible reading today comes from 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 to 21. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived, and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Continuing on from there. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is not a good report that I hear from the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favour with the Lord and also with man. This is the word of the Lord. Hello everyone and welcome again to Sylvania Anglican Church Online. This Sunday, the 1st of August, in the year of our Lord, 2021. My name is Mark Charleston, and it's my privilege to explain God's word today. Let me lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, help me to explain this passage today so that we might place our hope more fully and firmly in your Son, our Lord Jesus, the great High Priest. In his name we pray. Amen. Each of us has or had a father. For most of us, our fathers, our dads, have been powerful influences in our lives. Even though in most homes the mother is more directly involved in the upbringing of children, fathers can play a disproportionately large role in the upbringing of their children. For a while, dads were getting bad press in our community. There were even some people in our society wondering whether we need fathers at all. But it's been interesting in more recent years to see the shift back. 
as people have begun to recognise again how critical fathers are in marriages, families, in society. You see, fatherhood is not simply about biology. It's about relationship. It's about protection, about provision, about paternal love. The paternal love of a father for his children can be extremely significant. Sadly, there are some whose experiences of fatherhood have been negative. Over the last two weeks, we've seen the astonishing faith and prayerfulness of a mother. This Sunday, we meet a father. We encounter a father, a dad who failed, a dad who failed his sons, who failed his nation, and even more significantly, a dad who failed his God. It's a heartbreaking story, really. It's a disturbing story, a, an unsettling story. And we pick it up in chapter 2, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. What made matters worse is that Eli's sons, Phineas and Hophni, were priests of the Lord. We're told that they committed sacrilege. According to the law of Moses, the meat of sacrifices had to be offered in a certain manner. It was forbidden for priests to eat the fat of the sacrifices. Have a look at verse 15. Before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, you must give it now. And if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Have a look at this brief animation that helps us to get a sense of the tension in that situation. But it is not right for you to take the best parts. The priest does not want his meat boiled. Give him raw meat that he can roast. Take as much as you want, but first let us sacrifice the fat to the Lord. What's going on? Well, that man is a servant of the priests. The other man is taking his lamb to the altar where it will be offered to God in a holy sacrifice. It is not right. You demand that the priest portions of my sacrifice be the finest. But what about God? Doesn't he deserve our best? That's right. The man is right. If you do not give it to them now, I will take it by force. You are supposed to be priests of the Lord. How or can you... You would rather someone else be allowed to make an offering in your place today. Take what you will. They are supposed to take their share of what is left after the offering of the best parts. What they are doing is an offense against God. Excellent choices. Anyone else have a problem? Yes, Eli's sons were self-centered rather than God-centered. They were like religious mafia, grabbing and intimidating and showing no respect for God's word or for God's people. And sadly, their misbehavior did not stop there. Notice verse 22. Eli was very old and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting or the tabernacle was to be the place where God's people could be reminded of God's holiness, where God's people could have sacrifices offered for their sin. But instead, it now reflected a pagan temple, a pagan place of meeting. Now, of course, we know that the animal sacrifices that were offered in the Old Testament would never be a permanent solution to the sin of God's people. God's people would one day need a perfect saviour who would offer a perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. But the tabernacle and its religious, religious activities were to point to God. 
Instead, the spiritual leaders had turned it into a venue of evil. So what does Eli do? Notice what he does in verse 22. Verse 23, he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Notice what Eli tries to do. Eli desperately tries to establish boundaries for his sons. Boundaries to redirect their evil behaviour into the right direction. Now, of course, you and I know that boundaries can be good things. In recent years, boundaries has become a very popular term in contemporary psychology. It was made popular in Christian circles by two authors, Henry Cloud and John Townsend, who wrote the Boundaries series of books. Establishing boundaries is all about where to draw the line. Where to draw the line in the myriad of circumstances that we encounter in our lives. Boundary books are popular because we, all of us, can have difficulty setting boundaries. We can have difficulty drawing the line, especially in circumstances and challenging circumstances like raising children in families. We need help establishing boundaries. However, boundaries by themselves are inadequate because lying behind boundaries are priorities. We will always have problems setting boundaries if we don't have the right priorities. You see, Eli's boundaries did not work. He, he desperately tried to set boundaries for his sons, but he failed because he didn't have his priorities sorted out. You see, proper priorities promote loving boundaries. Proper priorities promote loving boundaries. If we're clear about our priorities, then we'll be clear about our boundaries. If we're unclear about what matters most, then this will exhibit itself in ineffective boundaries. The setting of boundaries is really a secondary issue. Our primary issue is not about the setting of boundaries, but about being clear about the Christian priorities that give shape to these boundaries. Eli had become totally ineffective, totally ineffective as the senior priest of God's people because he prized comfort over commitment to God's holiness. How do we know that? Well, in chapter 2, verse 29, we're told that Eli shared in the food that his sons stole. He shared in the food that his sons stole. And as senior priest, he had responsibility for his sons. He could have removed his sons from the priesthood. But instead, he tolerated them. Instead, he let them continue in their evil ways. By failing to take action, Eli actually fails his sons. He fails his nation and he fails his God. In verse 27, a messenger, a nameless messenger, comes from God to Eli. And he says in verse 29... Eli, why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded and honour your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel? And the, and the judgment, verse 31, Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. Verse 34, And this that shall come upon you, and this that shall come upon your two sons, Hopni and Phineas shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall, shall die on the same day. Yes, friends, brothers and sisters, this is a really sad story, isn't it? A sad, sad story about an ineffective father with two wayward sons. But the Bible tells us this story for a far deeper reason, a far more profound reason. We can certainly learn from this story 
we, as parents and grandparents, we can certainly learn from the negative example of Eli in this narrative. But God has given this story to us for an even more important reason. You see, it's a picture of dysfunctional spiritual leadership within the people of God. God's people are in a, an, in a terrible state by the time we get to this stage in Israel's history. Because there is no leader in the nation of Israel who follows the Lord wholeheartedly. No leader who follows the Lord wholeheartedly. Remember what we saw two weeks ago. In chapter 3, verse 1, we got a clue as to the spiritual diagnosis of the nation. Chapter 3, verse 1, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. The greatest famine that can happen in a nation, the worst drought that can plague a country, the saddest absence that can characterise a society, a household, a family, is the absence of the word of God. For when the word of God is rare, a nation is close to disaster. When the word of God is rare, people are close to judgment. Famous author G.K. Chesterton once said, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in everything. Friends, as you're watching church online today, I'm so pleased that you're hearing God's word. But I want to ask you this very personal question. Does the absence of God's word characterise most of your life? Does the absence of God's word characterise your life? Does it characterise your home? For where there is the absence of God's word, there is the personal absence of God himself. And yet there's a glimmer of hope in this narrative today. For interwoven within this sad narrative about Eli and his sons come a picture of the young Samuel. Now if you've got your Bibles on your laps, you would have noticed this because the description of Samuel is sandwiched in between the narrative about Eli and his sons. Have a look at verse 18. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. And the young man Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Verse 26. The young man Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favour with the Lord and also with man. You see, God was raising up a leader for his people. If you had seen, if you and I had been there and we had seen this boy Samuel dressed in priestly attire in the tabernacle, you and I may have been tempted to laugh at the sight. And yet God was at work. And when God is at work, he's at work to work out his plan. God always has a plan. And he often uses the most unexpected person in the most unexpected place to bring about his purposes. God would raise up a priest that would be faithful to him. You and I live on the other side of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You and I have the privilege of not only having the Old Testament before us today, but the New Testament as well. And we know that in the New Testament... The great ultimate high priest comes in the person of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 7 we read, The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Friends, God's people only have one priest. There are not many priests in God's church today. There is only one priest, 
the great high priest Jesus Christ. I am not a priest. My dear friend Andy Clark is not a priest. We have one priest who mediates between us and God, the God-man Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for our sins and rose again to eternal life, to offer us eternal life. We can put our trust in him, our great high priest, who offered the great sacrifice of himself. He, was both, he is both high priest and sacrifice. We can trust in him to the uttermost. We can trust in him completely, absolutely completely. And we live in a time of chaos and crisis at the moment, of ambiguity and uncertainty. But do not fear because the great high priest has come, Jesus, and he mediates between us and God. He brings us into relationship with God, our Heavenly Father. We can put our trust in him. We can walk with him each day. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we need not fear any evil because he is with us. In a few moments' time, you're going to listen and watch a new song from our friends at Emu Music. The song is entitled, This is the One. And this song reminds us that Jesus is the fulfilment. He is the completion of all God's promises. And so I hope you'll be encouraged by that song. But let me lead us in prayer before we hear this beautiful song together. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that even in the sad stories of Scripture, we can see your purposes being played out so that we can come into relationship with you in Christ. Father, we do pray that you might help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus at this time. We thank you for the faithfulness of Jesus the one who laid down his life for us so that we could be forgiven, the one who rose from the dead so that we could have eternal life. Please keep our trust firmly fixed in him. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a word. He is the one with power, with power unending. This is the one who heals the blind, with power to raise the dead to life. He promises forgiveness, forgiveness of your sin. He is the one who loves you first, the one who knew you before birth, before creation of the earth. Jesus. your soul. This is the one who reigns above the definition of love. He is the one who gives you, who gives you your new life. He is the one who loves you first, the one who knew you before birth, before creation of the earth. Jesus, he calls you out of darkest night and welcomes you into the Jesus He 
Cause someone bled for you, died for you, sought to make you his. Then he rose for you and clothed you in his righteousness. Someone bled for you, died for you, sought to make you his. Then he rose for you and clothed you in his righteousness. Friends, let's come together in a time of prayer uh, in response to God's word. Having uh, heard from our Heavenly Father, let's now come before him in prayer. And let's begin with a prayer of confession. Uh, the words are appearing on the screen now. Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbour as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbour and to live for your honour and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, let me invite you now to actually spend time uh, in quiet uh, personal prayer as we reflect on what God has spoken to you today. Uh, then I'm going to lead in prayer for the Overhaul family, our mission partners serving in Chile, uh, for our growth groups. And at the end of each of these prayers, uh, I will uh, say, Father, hear our prayer, and I invite you to respond through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I'll say, Father, hear our prayer. I invite you to respond through Jesus Christ our Lord. So firstly, uh, let's uh, pray about what God has spoken to us today. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let me pray for the Overhaul family. Father God, we thank you for your servants, Chris and Steph Overhaul, uh, and their kids, Elliot, Theo and Nathaniel, sharing Jesus in Chile. Thank you for enabling their recent safe return to Australia and their time quarantining in Brisbane. Please, Father, sustain them especially the kids as they feel the frustration of being cooped up. Please make their time back here refreshing and encouraging. Enable them to see family and friends and support churches uh, and give them the creativity uh, they need to be able to do this in midst of restrictions. Father, we also join with them in praying for the church in Chile with Christians having been unable to meet in person for almost two years now. Please, Father, sustain your people. Please grow your church in perseverance, in faith, in hope, in love. And we ask that you will bring relief from lockdown through widespread vaccination rollout. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord God, we bring before you our growth groups. We thank you for these small communities of grace that exist to deepen our faith and discipleship of Jesus. Please, Father, sustain the leaders with energy. Keep them faithful in teaching your word. Please also strengthen members to commit to meeting together online at present and not merely just in designated times. Um, please enable rich times of hearing your word and prayer so that your people are built in the faith 
with lives transformed to resemble our Saviour Jesus. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now please join me now in praying together the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the words appear on the screen uh, there for you. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, a couple of things uh, of news as we finish up our time together today. The first is just an encouragement to connect to one another. Uh, of course, we're not able to be uh, physically present with one another, so please do reach out, uh, get on the phone, send an email, uh, get on Zoom yourself, um, send a link through to those who you know struggle with technology perhaps, uh, but at, at this time of physical separation, it's so important that we continue to be the people of God, uh, caring for one another and uh, connecting with one another as we're able. So please do that. Um, certainly uh, those that you know live alone uh, or are isolated, please uh, get, reach out to them. Um, let them know uh, that you care for them, that you're with them. Please connect. Uh, secondly, it's just an encouragement to do that by joining us on our virtual gatherings on Zoom uh, on Sundays at 11 a.m. and or 7 p.m. Uh, we meet together to catch up, to encourage each other and to pray for each other. And of course, since we're not able to be here together on Sundays, um, church is all one way, isn't it, when we do it like this? So uh, those times on Zoom are a chance to actually do the the together time, fellowship together. So I encourage you to make that part of your Sunday church experience, 11 a.m. or 7 p.m. on Zoom. We'd really love to see you there. The last thing is just to remind you uh, to move all your giving online. Uh, please continue to support the work of the gospel here locally and, of course, through our mission partners um, by uh, giving online uh, and continuing to support that work uh, even when we're not physically gathering like this. So details for our church bank account are online, uh, are on the screen now for you to use. So please do uh, use those and continue to support the work of the gospel. Uh, well, friends, it has been uh, wonderful to be together as God's people today. Uh, let me leave you with some words from uh, 1 Peter again, uh, still in chapter 1. He writes, Though you have not seen Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving right now the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. God bless.